Hi, I'm Tony Williams. Uh, it's really nice to be at the Anik Music Festival again in a kind of virtual way. Uh, I'm going to read you some poems uh, from my recent book, Hawthorne City. That's uh, back to front for you, I think. Uh, it has writing, normal writing on the actual copy. Uh, so I'm going to read some poems first of all that are vaguely uh, Northumberlandy. Uh, so this first one is called The Count, and it draws on uh, those shepherds' counting songs that are common, uh, that were once common across the north of England and actually across quite a lot of Europe. Uh, most commonly, they're known through eeny, meeny, miny, mo, which literally in the counting means one, two, three, four. Uh, but there's lots of variations on that counting system, on the language. So this is my version. Yain attainer edera eek, pedera cedera my pal Pete, in the know and in the street, later tater, bump it, speak. Over a cover of pips old dicks, arno jiggit, brono sticks, lunker munker itera quicks, one, two, three, four, five, six. Month and hither and lither and stop, Helter skelter, lucky bone drop, pither and tither and rum tum tot, no and never and nout and not. Ederax, pederax, tickabub tune, yeen a bumfit afternoon, after laughter, polish and spit, fottery, fat as a fat dog shit. Yet to comfort, grey grass grew under your feet, and drowsed bis do, dicks and yeen dicks, jaundice, John has taken off his trousers on. Bilo tenra quincunx drain, vomit us up in court again, Neil mortis ex abyss, naught in total less than this. Uh, and this is a poem about gorse, which we see, which I see all over the place in, uh, in the Northumberland, in the kind of coastal region. Gorse's knuckles cracking, fire without its flames, there the figure beckons every child to run. High above the bracken, and by the wall to name the curlew's eerie whistle, sombre as a game. By the ruined bassel, placid horses stand, waiting for the colic that kills them in the end. The feeble alcoholics left a wash of rum in his other pocket, thirsting bangs its drum. The tree has lost its blossom, fruit has lost its tang, far from mummy's bosom, every thief must hang. Uh, and then I've got a couple of poems about walks. Uh, um, I've done quite a lot of walking around Annick with the dogs, um, and during lockdown when we could, when we could only walk from the house, uh, it was really wonderful to walk around Annick and walk on past that I just never had I've never walked on before or connecting up bits of bits of paths that were new. So um yeah that was really lovely. Uh so there's two his two short poems uh about walks and they're called Walk One and Walk Two To leap the gate and bless the hinge that turns aside where I impinge to palm the egg and wring the throat, and douse my hair with creosote, to hide my name inside a cough, and charm the lamb I'd carry off, to make a fire in my hat, to guard the silence of my path. And this is number two. The vagrant snoring under maps, the teeth that bite the local lips, the vagrant eye that wants to see all ditches, immortality. The, the vagrant light that infiltrates by broken fence the large estates. The vagrant feet that scuff and go away from every way you know. Uh, and now we're going to knit down the A1. Um, five or ten minutes down the A1, then turn off. Uh, to hang a left into Felton, and on that road that takes you into Felton, there are uh, three sycamores. And uh, a couple of years ago, the um, local composer Cheryl Cam asked me to write uh, a poem or 
or to write some lyrics that she would then set to music about uh, about these three sycamores and relating to uh, the Battle of Dunbar. And the Battle of Dunbar was um, uh, 1650, so it's part of the um, English Civil War, but it was between Cromwell's English army and the Scot Scots Presbyterian army. Um, uh, and Cromwell's army won, and afterwards they forced marched 5,000 Scottish prisoners south to England. Uh, and most of those 5,000 prisoners died during that march uh, south into England or in prison in Durham. And then the survivors were sold into slavery in the Americas. Uh, and about a month before the Battle of Dunbar, Cromwell had written a famous letter, a letter that's since become famous, um, uh, trying to avoid the war, saying, writing to the to the Scottish leaders, saying, um, uh, ask, asking them to think that it, it, the war might be avoidable. So this is the Felton sycamores. There grow inside my head on the Felton Road three trees, the starving and the sick and those who will survive to go across England's ocean. The Scottish soldiers stood between Dunbar's red stone, that hard place the Kirk, an English devil and the grey North Sea, and having lost, were taken on a tramping way that the world knows well, a people passing by with foreign voices towards a something worse that human pasts will mourn, but only landscape notice at the hour of its passing. How a sapling saw the march without a morsel, and shedding dead like seeds, so that has thickened there a grown memorial, whose bone-like roots can never quench the thirst of so much weeping, the memory of stumps that cares for no confession. On the long road, the trees do not turn their faces, but upbraid the wind, I beseech you, in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. Uh, okay, so now we're going to leave Northumberland for uh, two or three poems, and head down to where I grew up, which was um, Matlock in Derbyshire, so on the edge of the Peak District, a region that, um, when I was growing up, seemed to be really rural and relatively empty. And then I moved up to Northumberland, and when I go back, it seems like Piccadilly Circus down there. Uh, so this is a poem... Uh, I grew up in a house on a hill called Masson Hill, which is in Matlock. Um... And uh, this is a poem which is not named after, it's, it's actually called Helgafell, which is a, a sacred hill in Iceland, in medieval Iceland. Uh, there were vast ice-covered mountains, and then there this small hill, uh, which was somehow a sacred hill that, that, that meant something. Um, so this is a poem really about, uh, about Masson Hill, but it's called Helgafell. There is a quarry in my heart, the lovely lanes divide. One humps from Upperwood to Upper Town, by Ember Lane and Ember Farm, my family's farm, which has not been our farm for fifty years. At Bunsell's Market Cross, the clot of stone sends tassels out towards the barley mow, the moor, and down towards the valley's narrow chute that lands with laughing splashes at the pond at Scarvin. There's a bookshop here, so it's safe to leave us while we retrace and take the other fork down by the Wapping and the last few houses, Christine's and the Warns, and this one on the left, which had an empty pond and concrete turtle, a totem of the presence on the hill, whose cloak of bramble, altar which we raided, prevented every ingress. Through the woods, the skirt with steps like murmurs, St John's Chapel, shining cliff, the heights of Jacob, and there below the red mill and its chimney, and the path down into Scarthin, where the swans are waiting by the bookshop, and we find ourselves perusing local interest for a book to help us, 
but no geology can name the space from which the stone has gone. Uh, okay, and there's another uh, poem. So as I say, we, I grew up uh, in a house on that hill, uh, and actually two houses. So later on we moved a bit further down the hill, and that's the house that I really remember. But for the first few years of my life, we lived in a tiny cottage right on the top of that hill. Um, and I've got very, very vague... Uh, memories of that and at the time uh, my dad would go off to work and my mum at that time didn't uh, didn't drive a car and it was a mile to the bottom of the hill quite a steep hill so so in a sense we were kind of stuck although occasionally she would go out and you know walk out and get provisions but um, but it was a quite a quite a um, uh, quite an isolated existence um, so this is a poem which, which imagines that, her being there with a kind of uh, four or five-year-old me. Uh, it's called Winter 1982. Lighting the fire on a winter's morning. Good news that we'll be in all day. Maybe you'll climb inside the radio and maybe the snow will start to fall outside the glass and lunch will stretch over many decades. The teapot's hot breast and the fires crackle, the smell of soot, and the carpet's patterned dust, so hard to read the inky branches in the field, all this in the grate, and your fingers, quick with dry ash, like indoor snow, your knees on the hard hearth. How lonely you must have been, just you and the youngest, another day of cold, and nothing we spun through as different stars. Uh, and I shall finish off with another poem uh, about my mother and fires. So that was her kind of lighting the fire on a winter's morning. Um, but once the fire was going, um, she was a bit, or she is a bit of a pyromaniac. Um, and she'd, she'd basically just bung anything on the fire. So you, you might be sitting watching telly or reading a book and suddenly she'd come in and uh, throw some object on the fire, something that's like made of rubber or something, so then it would create toxic fumes, which you just say, ah, oh, be alright, it's burn away. So this is a poem, so this is my last poem, and it's called uh, What Man Threw on the Fire. The carcass of a chicken, a brace of mouldy boots, everything that's broken, anything that suits, a pair of rabbit's breeches, the scrapings of the sauce, all the window latches, all the open doors, heaped potato peelings, then the naked spuds, spectres of the coals, and gravy by the jug, a box, a bruise, a feather, dustpans full of dust, time to wonder whether what she burns is what she must. Can she burn the river? Should she burn the woods? When she burns such treasures, do they burn for good? Okay, well, it's been nice uh, reading to you in a virtual way. Um, I hope my dog barking and my email coming in didn't disturb you too much. Uh, look forward to, to, to enjoying the festival myself. Hope you do too. Um, and I hope to maybe see you in, in person next year.